in bridging the infrastructure investment gap and what multilateral development banks such as AIB can do to facilitate this. But before we begin, I would like to invite you to watch a video on AIIB's collaboration with Egypt. على خريطة العالم بتفصلنا حدود ومسافات لكن بيجمعنا نفس الطموح وبتواجهنا نفس التحديات التغير المناخي الزيادة السكانية وغيرها لكن التحدي الأهم والأكبر هو توفير الموارد واستغلالها بشكل يساعد على تنمية الإنسان ويحافظ على البيئة للأجيال اللي جاية والآن التحدي كبير كانت الفكرة في ديسمبر 2015 يشهد اقتصاد العالمي لحظة تحول بعد إعلان الصين بمشاركة 57 دولة تأسيس البنك الأسيوي للاستثمار في البنية التحتية واللي بيهدف لدعم الحكومات لتأسيس بنية تحتية خضراء مدعومة بالتكنولوجيا الحديثة AIIB plays a significant role in multilateral development with our high standard projects and modern governance. We finance infrastructure for tomorrow with a strong emphasis on mastering climate change and mobilizing private capital. خلال سنين قليلة من التعاون المشترك بين الأعضاء اللي وصل عددهم ل 106 دولة قدر البنك يساهم في تنفيذ مشروعات عملاقة في مجال البنية التحتية في أماكن كتير من العالم واللي وصل عددها ل 233 مشروع بتمويل قيمته 44.6 من 10 مليار دولار في 35 دولة كان طبيعي دولة بحجم مصر بتاريخها وثقافتها بوزنها السياسي والاقتصادي تكون عضو مؤسس في البنك الأسيوي للاستثمار في البنية التحتية ده غير إنها الداعم الأكبر للبنك في أفريقيا والشرق الأوسط بحصة تمويلية قيمتها 650 مليون دولار القيادة المصرية اهتمت بأن مصر تبقى متواجدة في محافل الدولية وخاصة الكيانات المالية الدولية وتوفير تمويل والمساهمة في التنمية وخاصة المشاريع اللي بتبقى ليها نوع من التواصل ما بين القارات أو عبر الحدود الدول مصر كان شايفة أن دوت يتوافق تماماً مع أولوياتها ومع رؤيتها لتطوير البنية التحتية والربط مع العالم الخارجي ومع باقي القارات خصوصاً أن مصر موقعها جغرافي متميز جداً هي تربط ما بين أسيا وأفريقيا وأوروبا و, و... عندها قدرة أنها تلعب دور أساسي في الفكرة دي تم إبرام عقد تمويل ما بين البنك الأهلي المصري وما بين البنك الأسيوي للاستثمار في البنية التحتية سنة 2021 البنك الأسيوي للاستثمار في البنية التحتية بيستفاد من شبكة الفروع بتاعة البنك الأهلي المصري في جميع أنحاء الجمهورية والبنك الأهلي المصري الحقيقة بيستفاد بالخبرات الواسعة اللي بيوفرها البنك الأسيوي للاستثمار في البنية التحتية في مجال الدعم الفني وتقييم الأثر البيئي والمجتمعي للمشاريع اللي هو بيمول ولأن أهداف البنك تتوافق بشكل كامل مع توجهات الدولة المصرية في الفترة الأخيرة كان التعاون بين الطرفين واللي نتج عنه مجموعة من المشروعات في قطاعات مختلفة بمساهمة من البنك وصلت لواحد وثلاثة من عشرة مليار دولار our largest portfolio outside Asia is in Egypt. And we are working on a pipeline of investment opportunities of a similar size. As part of this, we are financing large-scale renewable power, the Benban Solar PV program, for instance, our first private renewable project in Africa. In addition, our Alexandria Buki Railway gives an access to low-carbon public transport. We provide Sanitation to hundreds of thousands of homes. The Bank of Asia and the Smart Bank of the Tahtia is a team that is working on a project called the Bank of Asia. This is a combination of 32 companies in the world and 16,000 jobs for the young people of Egypt. And the project is worth 2 million and 2 million. It may start with the Bank of Asia and the Smart Bank of the Tahtia. We are with us in the Bank of Asia and the Smart Bank of the Tahtia. The year 2018-2019 is the Bank of Asia. خدمات الصرف الصحي المستدامة في المناطق الريفية هذا المشروع بنتكلم على 178 ألف وحدة سكنية يتم ربطها على المنظومة المتكاملة اللي احنا بنقول عليه 
ده بالإضافة إلى أنه جاري العمل بين مصر والبنك الأسيوي للاستثمار في البنية التحتية على عدد من المشروعات منها تمويل غير سيادي مع بنك مصر لتمويل مشروعات البنية التحتية المستدامة بقيمة 300 مليون دولار تطوير ميناء الحاويات بضميات بقيمة 140 مليون دولار إصدار سندات الباندا باليوان الصيني لإنشاء مشروعات خضراء مستدامة تصل قيمتها ل 500 مليون دولار بالرغم من أن مصر بتمثل نقطة مهمة في حركة التجارة بين أوروبا وأسيا وأفريقيا إلا أن لحد سنة 2014 نصيب مصر من عمليات التجارة دي لم يتجاوز 1% بسبب ضعف البنية التحتية في الطرق والمواني لكن بعد التاريخ ده اتغير الحال حفرنا قناة السويس الجديدة اللي اختصرت زمن عبور السفن من 22 ل 11 ساعة في المجرى الملاحي الأهم في العالم اتحركت الدولة بكامل قوتها وتبنت خطة قومية لتطوير قطاع الطرق والنقل والمواني بتكلفة 1.7 تريليون جنيه مصري جددنا وسائل النقل البري ودخلنا وسائل حديثة زي المونوريل والقطار الكهربائي بدأنا خطة تنمية شاملة في سيناء وبنينا أنفاق جديدة للربط بينها وبين باقي مناطق مصر علشان تكون جسر حقيقي بين الشرق والغرب وعلشان نواجه تحدياتنا بنينا عشرات المدن من أهمها العاصمة الإدارية الجديدة اللي رعينا فيها نسب المساحات الخضراء بالمقارنة مع مساحات المباني ولتحسين ظروف المعيشة أطلقنا في 2019 مبادرة حياة كريمة اللي بتهدف لتقديم حزمة متكاملة من الخدمات في مجال التعليم والصحة والنواحي الاجتماعية خلال التسع سنوات الماضية استطاعت مصر أن هي تستثمر وبقوة شبكة قوية جداً من الطرق والكباري والأنفاق وده بيؤهل مصر أنها تقدر تستقطب استثمارات إقليمية وأجنبية بقوة خلال الفترة القادمة عندنا النهاردة الحقيقة برضو مواني ومناطق لوجستية بنيت على أحدث الوسائل ووفقا لأفضل المعايير وعندنا كمان بيئة الشعية بتساهم وبتدي مساندة كبيرة للمستثمر المحلي والأجنبي من أكثر المزايا اللي موجودة في مصر والجاذبة للاستثمار المشروعات البنية الأساسية اللي بقت موجودة في كل أماكن جمهورية مصر العربية الاستثمار في البنية التحتية بيهيئ المناخ لجزم استثمارات في عدة مجالات وتهيئة العوامل المناسبة لجذب هذه الاستثمارات وضخها في الاقتصاد القومي وجود قيادة وطنية واعية وعندها رؤية مع شعب عظيم زي الشعب المصري احنا رسالة بنقولها مصر قادرة وهتكمل مشوار مصر التاريخ مصر الحضارة أم الدنيا اللي علمت العالم النهاردة بتفتح باب لتحقيق تعاون وشراكة حقيقية والتنمية هي هدفنا After this beautiful video, for the final, final part of this morning's program, I am delighted to announce that we will hold a panel discussion on the role of multilateral development banks in private sector capital mobilization for bridging the infrastructure investment gap. It is my honor to invite to the stage as panelists Her Excellency Dr. Sri Mulyani Indrawati, AIIB Governor and Minister of Finance of the Republic of Indonesia, his Excellency, Mr. Mehmet Shimshek, AIB Governor and Minister of Treasury and Finance of the Republic of Turkey, Mr. Jose Lito Camacho, member of AIB's International Advisory Panel and former Secretary of Finance of the Philippines, Mr. Hassan Alam, CEO of Hassan Alam Holdings, his Excellency, Mr. Jin Li Chun, President and Chair of the Board of Directors of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and as moderator, His Excellency Dr. Mohamed Maid, Minister of Finance of the Arab Republic of Egypt.
السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته فخامه السيد الرئيس آه دي جلسه حواريه استاذ ام ام جونا سبيك ان عربيك سو بليز يوز ترانسليشن دي جلسه حواريه عن يعني this is a panel discussion about the role of the developmental banks in mobilizing the investments in the public sector uh, the private sector in order to invest in infrastructure and uh, to help and contribute uh, uh, to sustainability and uh, creating job opportunities. Um, concerning the infrastructure projects, uh, especially in the developing countries, uh, uh, the, the rate of such percentage uh, is uh, larger than uh, uh, in any country. For example, in a multilateral bank, um, the, the private capital contributes uh, to the needs uh, to invest in infrastructure all over the world. However, for many reasons, it's not easy to benefit from the private capital in order to do so. And the multilateral banks like AIIB, the AIIB can play a pivotal role in the participation of the private sector in investments, especially infrastructure, and especially in the emerging economies. That's why one of our main priorities and our main goals in the strategy, the strategy of the AIIB bank, the main strategy of the bank is to mobilize the financial resources from the private sector and enhances the contribution of the private sector in investments and projects. So the bank is playing a good role and contribution to enhance investment in infrastructure as a priority in order to enhance uh, economic development. This is a panel discussion in order to know more from our guests about how for the developmental banks, especially AIIB, how these types of banks can achieve their own goals represented in establishing an information system and uh, a system that corresponds to the mobilization of uh, capital and in order to contribute, uh, help the private sector to contribute to sustainability and economic development in our countries and to improve the livinghood of uh, uh, this, our citizens. My first question is for Mr. Hassan Alam, the uh, CEO of the Hassan Alam Holding Company. You have participated in uh, investing in infrastructure in Egypt. How can you assess and evaluate the challenges that is faced by the private sector in investments? And what is the role of the multilateral developmental banks and how they cont can contribute to investing in infrastructure and encouraging the private sector? Thank you so much. I'm going to answer in English. Uh, to start off the conversation, uh, Africa and the Middle East are home to uh, approximately 1.5 billion uh, people, and uh, uh, the average age is 19, which means that this part of the world is uh, very much uh, ripe for uh, infrastructure investment and in uh, great demand for infrastructure investment to take place uh, on an accelerated pace to overcome years and years of a lack of spending on critical, uh, critical uh, infrastructure that is needed in the healthcare, uh, education, water, and clean energy sectors and transport sectors, sectors as well. Uh, having said that, uh, the role of the private sector is clear. Uh, the opportunity exists, real demand exists, just because of the sheer uh, population size and the need for these services that are now lagging behind due to uh, a lack of development that has taken, that has happened uh, over the course of previous years. Some countries have accelerated this growth like Egypt and have bridged this gap to a certain extent and are now uh, in a leading position and other countries are lagging behind for multiple reasons. Uh, so the opportunity is there. 
the main challenge is uh, to be able to create uh, programs that allow uh, these public-private partnerships to take place and to move at an accelerated pace to match the, what is required by society and the communities. So sometimes we feel that the inception of the idea is there. To take it from concept to finalization and award takes an enormous amount of time, which sometimes changes the dynamics of the project and sometimes causes it uh, not to uh, come to surface in due time. So to respond to the second half of the question, which is how can MDBs help us? We know that in reality, the demand is there. The private sector is more than happy to cooperate and invest so long as there is a clear procurement uh, process, so long as risks are mitigated. And MDBs can support in aligning with governments a procurement process. They can support in providing affordable financing that reduces risk and doesn't require uh, massive uh, sovereign guarantees that sometimes uh, slow down the development of these much needed projects. And finally, they bridge uh, the gap between uh, what the private sector would ultimately need to see and benefit from and what the government wants to achieve in terms of uh, social development. Thank you very much, Yuf. Uh, pointed to a number of challenges and also that the need for MDBs to play a bigger role in alleviating those challenges. I will ask the same question to Mr. Jose Olmacho, finance minister, former finance minister of the Philippines. You have taken this post in the Philippines, but currently you work in the private financial sector. Are you, you are aware of the financial capabilities of different countries in financing their needs? their citizens' needs of infrastructure, and you also know the expectations of investors and all their needs. And hereby we ask, in your opinion, how can the private and public capital work together in a better way or in a better partnership so that they can bridge these major gaps in financing infrastructure and at the same time, we are asking different MDBs especially AIIB, about what they can offer to encourage these partnerships in this field between private and public sector. For this opportunity to, to share with you some observations and views coming from both public and private sector, as I have, uh, as I have done. As you rightly pointed out, I think um, there's certainly a big gap in financing infrastructure requiring the collaboration between the public and the private sector. And here, when I talk public, I want to uh, make reference specifically to governments, and they're represented here by the governors of the AIB, uh, but also the MDBs themselves, which have a very important role in this collaboration with private capital. I think Hassan has already mentioned expectations of, of uh, private capital. And with private capital, I, I, I think it's also important to... to um, see, recognize that there are two types. There are strategic investors, people like Hassan and his family, but there are also financial investors represented by banks and the capital markets. Um, I think for governments, I'd like to uh, say that um, the expectation of private capital is that government should provide an investment climate where investment policies are predictable, they are clear, they are stable, and more importantly, they are applied equally or with the, with the level playing field so that private investors, private capital will know that when they go into an economy and invest in infrastructure, that they will be treated fairly like, every, like everyone else. I believe that for most governments, there's also an opportunity um, to encourage more of this private-public uh, partnership by establishing uh, private property programs, or PPPs, as they are known in many economies, uh, perhaps even establishing an office to directly promote um, the, uh, the PPP program so that it's clear. Again, the, the expectations are clear on both sides. We know where, which segments the government would like to channel private capital in terms of infrastructure. 
Um, and, and there are many examples around, around the world. I'm not sure if Egypt already has one, but I would certainly encourage it. Um, the third point I'd like to, uh, to, to share, with, especially with government representatives here, is that there are opportunities for governments to provide a legal framework that would allow a freer and a bigger flow of private capital into infrastructure. Um, there are some governments, uh, specifically in Asia, I can think of Singapore and Thailand, that have established legal frameworks that allow the establishment of infrastructure funds or business trust that allow capital to flow freely, perhaps even allow for listings of these investment funds or business trust in their stock exchanges, providing for public capital to, to enter. Now, MD MDBs has a, a very important role as well, and, and specific to AIIB, I know it's done a great job over the eight years that it has, uh, since it was established, but there's a lot more it can do. I guess the, the, the most critical aspect where NDBs can play a role is really bridging the gap between the risk of inherent that they're in projects, in, inherent in projects, and the risk that private capital is able to take, because it is not able to take every risk inherent in, 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 uh, in projects. Um, for instance, uh, there are many frontier markets, less developed economies, where public capital cannot just enter because they don't have the, the appetite or the ability to take the risk of those frontier markets. MDBs can certainly provide credit enhancements, credit guarantees, so that such economies can access the public capital markets. Uh, there are, um, for example, in, for specific to infrastructure, the early stage of infrastructure development, construction period, it's not usually something that private money, private capital can absorb. And then again, that's an area where MDBs can play. Um, longer term durations. Private capital, specifically private equities, usually has a five, five to seven year time frame. Many infrastructure will require much longer uh, capital to be able to, uh, to develop. So they, again, MDBs like the AIB can, can, can cover those. Uh, local currency risk, a, a, a risk that is uh, very important to address. Foreign capital does not have the ability to absorb lo local currency risk. And yet, infrastructure projects by nature generates local currency, not foreign currency. So again, you need intervention to be able uh, to bridge that gap. Political risk, I mean, something that MDBs are very familiar with, uh, very important to private, uh, private capital. A second area where MDBs can play a role, in my mind, and, and relating to the earlier comment I made about government, providing legal frameworks that will allow the freer flow of capit private capital into infrastructure, is really to be an advocate, to be an advocate to government, to, to its member countries, to promote the creation of this legal framework. And perhaps when this, frame, this, this framework is in place, even play an active role of underwriting or anchoring or, or acting as an anchor investors in those infrastructure funds and business trusts that I earlier mentioned. The AIB has been very, very active and very successful in invent, investing in private equity funds directed towards infrastructure. I'd, I'd like to see the AIB to go beyond that and, 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 and take a more active role. The, the limitation of investing in private equity funds is that you are subject to the appetite and the processes and the, the values of those private equity funds. May not necessarily always align with what the AIIB would like to accomplish. So I would certainly encourage the AIIB and other MDBs to take a more active role in, in perhaps even leading those project finance ideas, directly investing in private in, in infrastructure, not necessarily through through private equity funds, and, and perhaps create lead, cre creating those funds themselves that are much more closely aligned to its values and its, its, its mission. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think uh, uh, Mr. Jose, little Macho, uh, give some homework for President Jen to take uh, home. And also for us, uh, he mentioned many uh, elements which uh, could help uh, in ensuring that uh, private uh, public partnership can work better and also uh, more support from um, the MDBs. Uh, now I go to uh, Her Excellency uh, uh, 
سري مولياني اندرواتي يعني هي زميله وصديقه عزيزه ويعني وزيره ماليه الدوله وبتعتبر احد صنايع السياسات الماليه في واحد من اكبر الاقتصادات العالميه واكثرها ديناميكيه around the world and most dynamic in Asia. And our question for her will be, what are your political priorities through which you can attract and facilitate the process of uh, private investments in infrastructure, especially that Your Excellence has presided over the G20 last year? And this was one of the topics that, like multinational MDBs and how they can move finance towards the private sector in a way that it can contribute with a major role in the process of development. And as for the AIIB and for other MDBs, from your point of view, what can be done from your own point of view? What can be done in the coming stage, especially from the side of the AIIB, in light of the challenges that governments face now, that they are unable to pump more investments in infrastructure and in a bigger need for MDBs to help and support the private sector to play a bigger role in this regard? Thank you very much. Minister Ahmad Maid. First, uh, I think what already mentioned by two previous uh, speaker on the uh, perspective of the private sector, the political and policy priority for any government in order for us to be able to invite more uh, private sector and especially on infrastructure, which is more complex in this case, is first to provide the right regulatory and policy framework. And that is actually being recognized by two previous speaker. And this is the area which the AIB can advise in terms of what kind of policy framework because usually country knows what to do but not necessarily know how to do. What is easier to be understood than the how because the how is related to the capacity, technical and even sometimes political feasibility. So this area on a policy making process, regulatory framework, being widely recognized, but how to implement from designing the legislation, implementing in terms of the institutional building, and creating certainty and consistency in implementing those policy is going to be very important. Here, the role of many multilateral development banks, including MDBs, can provide through their instrument. I think AIIB is now stepping through the pandemic that they are now talking about program loan rather than the project loan. This is the area that can be expanded. The second one, we are all knows that the private sector have all their own uh, risk taking as well as risk appetite. And usually huge gap between the public activity or infrastructure with the ability of the private sector uh, in which they are going to accept this kind of risk. And that's why what is being advised, policy and political priority, including Indonesia, is establishing this kind of bridge, catalytic. We created special mission vehicle within the Ministry of Finance in order for us to establish project development fund. Because we can see that, oh, we need infrastructure, but how you are going to develop the project? It's going to be takes time and technical expertise. How you are going to make sure the financial is going to be also feasible? Then we create a lot of instrument, for example, like viability gap, in which we are going to create this kind of bridge between the appetite, risk of return of the private sector, and the economic rate of return of this infrastructure or the project itself. I think this is the area in which MDBs, including AIB, have the expertise in actually not only providing advice, but they also can create this catalytic role also. Because government usually, especially in developing poor country, their instrument is not strong enough and not credible enough. And that's why it need to be supported by the institution like the MDBs or AIIB. For an emerging country, they maybe have a more track record, has been recognized by market, and that's why we can provide this kind of instrument like project development fund, guarantee fund, 
uh, viability gap fund, those which is creating this match between the appetite of the private and the real project rate of return and risk itself. So this is the area that AIIB could provide more instrument <coughs> so that they can supplement and creating a catalytic role for many countries which need this kind of support. The third one, we are also know that many of this infrastructure is actually have the local currency revenue. If it is even generating revenue, whether this is water, electricity, telecommunication, while borrowing is on a foreign exchange. And that's why this mismatch between the currency is going to be one of the biggest that can affect the feasibility and rate of return. These are the area also that could provide uh, AIIB through the local currency bonds market or in this case providing a certainty in terms of the maturity mismatch and the currency mismatch. Because as two previous speakers mentioned that usually private sector, they can stand under seven years, eight years, but not 30 years unless the government providing a certainty in terms of guarantee, contract, or in this case also related to this uncertainty on uh, exchange rate as well as maturity. So these are all very heavy environments. And AIIB is, of course, financial institution, and that's why you need to have more providing financing. Because infrastructure is more maybe work on engineering, environment, but at the end of the day also need a very sound and strong uh, what we call it the financial structure that is acceptable from the private sector appetite but at the same time also accountable from the public sector point of view because public official and for us as a minister they are going to be scrutinized from the political optic rather than financial optic but it doesn't mean that you can only pass the political optic without passing the financial optic because then you cannot get this infrastructure to be delivered. So I think these are all the area. Indonesia, using the G20 in this case, as well as ASEAN this year, as you ask, we try to promote this private sector, for example, on a climate and related to the sustainable development finance. We know that this kind of complex situation can only be addressed if we work together. That's why during the G20 presidency, we continue promoting and uh, strengthening the cooperation. We establish a blended finance. Because again, the blended finance is not only public, private. There is a lot of philanthropic. In this case, we just really want to provide. But how you are going to combine and blend this finance that is going to be working effectively in achieving this problem? Now, Indonesia is already announcing like SDG, Sustainable Development uh, Goal Blended Finance, in which we put our own money, but then we provide platform for many other source of financing, both M MDB, private sector as well as uh, philanthropy, philanthropy. They can make a, a, a choice between whether they are going to invest in a just lending, which is usually that is the easiest, through the equity financing, which is more complex, or can be a combined by providing catalytic and risk management. These are all maybe the blended finance is going to be one of the most important tests for this climate change as well as financing can be delivered. I think many countries are already making this kind of announcement. Indonesia during the G20 is already announcing the energy transition mechanism with the JETP, that is how we are going to jointly mobilize global financing in order to finance the transition of the energy in Indonesia. 20 billion has been announced. Now need to be translated into a transaction, and that is the real work. And last thing, on the ASEAN chairmanship, as I mentioned earlier on my opening, private sector usually also participate through the capital market, and they need to see whether financing climate change is not punishing them. For Indonesia, meaning that when we retire, coal power plant, they are going to be seen that you are financing coal, although it's actually retiring coal. And that need to be answered through this policy framework like taxonomy. That's why we're promoting the ASEAN taxonomy version 2, in which providing more clarity what kind of financing which is qualified as green, yellow or amber in this case, or 
totally red, which is prohibited. So these are all the area which I think AIIB as an institution need to continue supporting a lot of homework for many uh, developing and emerging country challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency Siri Mulyani. I think you've touched a lot of uh, very, uh, very important points, and uh, you've mentioned one of the points which I think uh, the AIB has to take it into consideration on the matching between local currency and foreign currency in order to push for investment. I think this will be one of the challenges for uh, mobilizing capital uh, for private sector. Um, and I think the IB has to take into consideration how to uh, allow the private sector and support the private sector to go for raising capital uh, internationally. Um, we will listen uh, to Ms. Jen to know his view on that. But let me now uh, talk to uh, His Excellency uh, Minister Mohammed Shemshik. Uh, I know you received your uh, uh, post uh, uh, recently, not far away, um, as a Minister of Finance for Turkey, and you are the governor of Turkey for the AIB Bank. And I think you are you, you similar to some other Minister of Finance facing challenges, a lot of challenges, and um, managing the budget uh, uh, and determining uh, I know the private sector for Turkey we know that the private sector in Turkey plays a major role and their participation is major there is very big in Turkey but also in the framework of a bigger enhancement and bigger cooperation in the project of infrastructure and if you ask MDBs especially the AIIB to play a bigger role we will ask the same question what are your suggestions and your demands to different MDBs and the AIIB what would you like them what would you like from them to do to encourage more investments to be pumped in this framework to invest in infrastructure first of all I'd like to congratulate Egypt for the excellent organization and also warm hospitality clearly the MDB's balance sheets and domestic fiscal resources are not enough to cover the needs in infrastructure investments so there is a compelling case to attract private sector uh, financing uh, over the past couple of decades, we managed to attract about roughly 50 billion U.S. dollars in transport, <coughs> in transport infrastructure and also healthcare, um, mainly from private sector. And I think the key here is government guarantees that provides predictability. But of course, you have to have, you know, sustainable public finances, meaning you have to have good fiscal discipline, sound fiscal policies. Uh, that's one of the key to ensure that your guarantees ultimately will be, you know, delivered. Um, MDBs can play a significant role in mitigating the risk, in, in de-risking, because private sector doesn't want to commit long-term funding, um, in particular during the construction uh, period you know, it's, it's a risky period. The completion risk is there, the construction risk is there. There are all sorts of other risks associated. So it's really critical that MDBs step in uh, with creative, innovative financial solutions. I know the, the balance sheets are not, you know, gonna be large enough to provide all that. So that's why creativity matters. What really is important is to help reduce risk, and that's what, what we call credit enhancement. We worked very closely with the likes of EBRD, IFC over the past few decades, and of course we got a lot of financing globally, both from the West and, and of course from Asia like Japan and, and Korea. I think the reason why we succeeded 
in attracting uh, that much money was largely associated with sound fiscal policies of the past few decades. But equally important, government guarantee has helped and the MB, you know, MDB's involvement clearly was, was very helpful. Going forward, uh, we've largely done with our basic infrastructure and healthcare investments. What we are focused on really is green transition. It's really not a choice, uh, it's a necessity. Last year we paid 97 billion US dollars for imports of oil and gas. This year we're paying about 75 billion US dollars. So uh, we are strongly focused on investing in renewables. This will help us achieve the net zero goal by 2053, but more importantly, it will help reduce our dependency on uh, you know, imports of oil and gas, and of course, uh, clearly, uh, that's, that's, that's the way forward. The other area that uh, we are focusing is to deepen domestic capital market so that domestic uh, assets, domestic savings pool can also be directed. I think having a, a well-functioning private pension schemes sometimes helps because those are long-term uh, funding sources and they can be committed, deployed to infrastructure projects that pay off over the long period of time. Not to repeat previous speakers' you know, points, uh, you should treat infrastructure investments like a long-term bond. And I think the more predictability and visibility is there in terms of sound policies, right investment climate, and also risks you know, associated with it, the more likely you are successful in, in attracting the private sector funds, and it's really key. As far as AIIB is concerned, I think having local presence in countries is very important if, because when you have local presence, you can identify bankable projects uh, easily. You can also work with authorities and you can also rally domestic resources. Uh, so I think we would encourage um, MDBs, in particular AIIB, to uh, start building domestic presence in, in, in member countries. I think that would certainly be very helpful. And as I said, to focus on more providing guarantees rather than providing the full funding um, if we were to attract uh, private capital. Thank you. Thank you very much. To provide more guarantees. <laughs> so this is uh, what uh, His Excellency uh, Minister Mohammed Shemshik uh, mentioned. I, I think, uh, um, Jen, you've got what we are looking forward uh, from the uh, MDBs uh, and the uh, LIB. Uh, um, uh, Especially with the growing role that they have gained in the past eight years, this question now is what will the AIIB do to facilitate with all the challenges that we have discussed? How will they help the private sector to have a bigger opportunity to move these funds and these finances to invest in infrastructure and to bear a bigger share in development and bridge this gap in financing infrastructure in a lot of our countries? You know the number of the countries that you yourself know. There are more than 60 years and they all look forward to the bank to bear this responsibility and to have a share in it. What will you respond? How will you respond to that? Thank you. We appreciate the cooperation with the private sector partners as well as the development partners in the public sector. And by working almost 80 years now, we can feel better. Uh, the private sector's feelings, their demand, and their requests about to the MDBs how we can work together. Uh, when we started conceptualization of Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, we thought at the very beginning, with the support of almost everyone, um, like Egypt, in creating a multilateral development bank fit for the 21st century. This bank 
must be able to provide both the public and private sector non-sovereign guaranteed uh, financing to reduce the public pressure on the government's balance sheet. So starting from day one, this bank operates under the same roof, two branches, public sector and uh, non-public sector. But we work together. Our teams can take both the public sector financing and non-sovereign bank financing with experience uh, gained from other institutions. So we understand fully the importance we must pay to the, to the mobilization of private sector development. Now, first, we understand private sector vote with their feet. So only when they work in a country with a very good enabling environment for business, the ease of doing business is very much important. The policy, regulatory policy must be predictable, consistent. If there's any change, there must be change for the better. So the private sector would feel comfortable. We are here keeping constant dialogues with our uh, client members' governments to understand them and to uh, see how we can work together to provide such a climate, business, doing business climate for the private sector to participate. So predictability. And uh, we understand the private sector people are willing to take risks, but they are reluctant to take uncertainty. So this is what we've been doing. Second, secondly, there are lots of very good, promising private sector projects. But in many low-income countries, it's very hard to finance those projects, uh, which seems to be a a little bit costly. So we work together, we provide low cost, long term financing for us in 20 years to the pri 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 private sector so they feel comfortable, they are not worried about refinancing every couple of years. And the third uh, is we try to make it possible for the private sector investors to take the in infrastructure investment investments as the asset class. And uh, in so doing, uh, the private sector could uh, uh, find some very good uh, ways of doing business. For instance, we have the Bayfront, uh, we have the Bayfront investment management uh, demonstrate that we understand they look for this. So Bayfront is a platform for securitizing, securitizing infrastructure loans that allows institutional investors to invest as an asset class. So this is a new asset class and it would be uh, offering opportunities for the private sector investors to, to do more investments. So we understand it's important. That's why the corporate strategy would guide us to achieve more than 50% of the financing in the private sector. So we are continue, we will continue to be working with the public sector and the private sector investors to understand them better and to fine tune our uh, lending policies and strategies. So by working together, uh, we can create a, a future which is better for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Njen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the name of Allah, allow me in the beginning to welcome Mr. Jin and all the gentlemen and the finance ministers and all the honorable guests who are with us here today. We are very pleased to have this opportunity of hosting this conference after a hiatus of almost three years. 
We held previous virtual conferences in 2020, 21 and 22. And here in Egypt, we are in Sharm el-Sheikh, hosting it for this year, and we were very keen on preparing the city of Sharm el-Sheikh in the most convenient way to host this conference that we hope for the best to achieve in. Let me comment first on three points. The first is our appreciation for the bank and the role that it achieves in the past years and the level that they have reached in an unprecedented time. It became the second MDB with the ability to have a financial portfolio worth $1 billion with a rating from Fitch, for example, a rating of triple A with a stable vision of it, and also the financing that they have provided in the past few years, as mentioned in the presentation, more than $44 billion for over 50 countries, for over 200 projects, which is amazing. But allow me to say this. This needs more and more finance, low-cost finance, especially in light of the current circumstances, the financial, the economic circumstances the world is going through after through COVID-19, the two years of COVID-19, and the repercussions of the Russian-Ukrainian crisis. In light of these very hard economic circumstances the world is going through, to have an MDB institution like this that needs to invest or to pump more low-cost investments, especially in emerging economies or weak and poor economies in light of the challenges that we're discussing. As for the cooperation of the bank with Egypt, I also record my appreciation, state my appreciation. We're talking about a portfolio that's worth $1.3 billion, and we look forward for more. That's the first point, and I don't want wish to add any more than what have already been said. But the second point I would like to talk about now is the very important discussion that we had on infrastructure and the role of the investment, the private sector in it. I will talk about the Egyptian experience in that as to enrich our discussion more and to offer you our experience in this regard. We had, in the most honest words, we had a major gap in infrastructure in Egypt. And we had two paths to go through, one related to the country to have investment projects that are very encouraging to finance the infra an infrastructure that can take the Egyptian economy to better horizons, or to encourage the private sector to move along with us in these projects. I'm not just talking to the guests who are here with us. The Egyptian people are listening to what we're saying right now, and it's important for the Egyptian people to know that this path could have been very successful with the private sector, but it would have taken a longer time to bridge this gap, and I'm saying a major gap, in infrastructure in Egypt. The private sector could have done this, whether Egyptian or other or otherwise, they could have bridged this gap. But I think that the time frame and the requirements that we were obliged to achieve would have taken more, much more time. We as a state have worked through the past eight years with all our efforts to bridge and end this gap and to have a basic infrastructure for the state in all fields, especially that what I'm talking about here is this gap was not just in one sector other than the other. It was in every sector, in energy sector, in transportation sector. It was a major gap. So the effort made by the state and what we have achieved in the past seven or eight years, a lot of it has been achieved through loans to achieve so that we don't go through 
dilemmas of reaching our goals so that our state can be capable with its basic infrastructure to go through and work with the Egyptian private sector that we highly appreciate. And this is not just for the conference you're talking. No, I will talk about the measures that we have taken in the past few years to encourage the private sector in. But let me say once again, our experience is that we have spent a lot of money to make the perfect infrastructure for our state so we can reach better horizons in the development of different fields. Our path as a country, as we said, is that the state itself is responsible for doing this and responsible for providing the investment financing. We're not talking about billions, we're talking about trillions here. Trillions of dollars and pounds that have been spent in the past eight years to build this infrastructure that we are talking about right now that we can humbly say that it has become very developed, very capable, and very sufficient to move forward for a better economic future. Is the private sector now, has it been far away from achieving this? No, the private sector has been working with us hand by hand. The private sector companies worked in these projects. Private sector companies weren't able to achieve them alone. We contributed with a large part, with a bar, very large share of these financing that went to the private sector companies to operate in the perfect way. That's why I imagine that the private sector companies that work with us, that's almost 5,000 companies, most of the projects that have been implemented in Egypt have been by Egyptian companies from the private sector. Is today, is our state today, does it have the political will to make sure that the private sector is leading development in Egypt? Yes. It already exists and have been translated not just into words, but into statements from the government, from the political leadership represented in the, the president, but also we have stated before in the we aimed to say that all the exceptions or the privileges that the public sector enjoyed have been cancelled and now we deal with equal opportunities we deal in equal opportunities we give equal opportunities to all sectors from both sectors that's why the high council of investment have initiated more than 22 decisions to make incentives, to offer incentives to the private sector to make it more able to operate in the Egyptian state. The third point I would like to talk about now is that we have issued, we have launched a number of projects, almost 140 or 150 projects. We said that we will give them incentives up to tax exemptions by 10% or 15% to work in the projects that we give priorities to. I'm saying this because Mr. Jin and the infrastructure that we are aiming to achieve, and I have already said this before many times, I'm talking now about Africa, through our experience here in Egypt, in infrastructure, we have come to know that not only through good planning, but planning and implementation and realizing what we have done, that this is very important to us, very important for the African continent to develop and become bigger. And this will have will happen through low cost financing because all the economic challenges that I have spoken of before in the past four years until now, I've always said that we need low-cost financing so that the burdens, the financial burdens, wouldn't become bigger on the Egyptian state in this regard. And that's the role of an MDB like you to share with us today. I will not take any more time. I welcome all of you here in Egypt. It's the first time to have this conference here in Africa and in Egypt. And we wish you very fruitful discussions I wish you all the best and please remember to take the opportunity
to entertain yourself. We will not just talk about business. Welcome, everyone, once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. وشك الانهيار وشك الضياع والشعب كان فاقد الامل والثقه في مستقبل افضل وكان لابد من اعاده بناء الانطباع لدى المصريين بعد خمس سنين بفضل الله سبحانه وتعالى وفضل شعب مصر وتضحياته احنا في موقف ووضع تاني خالص دائما برامج الاصلاح الاقتصادي برامج بتحتاج الى رؤيه سياسيه واراده سياسيه كبيره وعزيمه شعب ان احنا ننفذ هذه الاجراءات. اي حكومه لما بتتعامل مع قضايا شديده الاهميه بتخضع في الاعتبار 